a fun and safe Independence Day this last week. Uh, anybody do a cookout or was it just too hot? <laughs> too hot, okay, everybody cooked in, good. I uh, want to let you know about a few things as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, we do have a special guest with us, uh, Judy McCasey is uh, on the piano for us this morning down here from Avon Park. So I uh, want to give her a special thanks. Uh, of course, Claude and Julie are out of town, Ken is out of town, and be praying for Avis. Uh, she's had a couple of episodes of AFib this weekend and is up at Advent Hospital right now. So Judy is uh, a lifesaver this morning and we really appreciate her being here. Uh, Avis is fine, she's just getting tests, so they want to know why? But other than that, just keep her in your prayer. Uh, as well, the uh, flowers on the altar this morning have been placed in honor of David and Sharon Mathias, who are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. <laughs> After church, they will be in the back to let you know how they've done it. So. <laughs> Uh, next Sunday, July 14th, is Lakeview's turn to lead worship over at the Lake Placid Health and Rehab Center. You're welcome to come and join us for that. Be there by 1.45, so you have time to sign in and get settled before the service starting at 2. Uh, Monday, July 15th, will be Chat and Chew at Dock 633 up on Lake June Road. Becky Hamblin is uh, the one who is coordinating that, so see her. Uh, the July-August newsletter has gone out in email and is available for print in the back if you would like a copy. As well, the latest edition of the Upper Room devotional is back there as well. And we'll ask at least one more time if you are on Facebook and are not yet following the Lakeview Christian Church page, please do so. Facebook has recently updated the rules that you have to have at least 100 followers as an organization page in order to live stream. And uh, at the, towards the end of June, we found out we only had 90, and that's why we couldn't get up on Facebook. So we have gotten across that threshold, but it wouldn't hurt to pad the stats just a little bit in case they up it to 115. So, uh, but please do, uh, if you are on Facebook, go by and follow us on there, and maybe recommend it to a couple of friends, because, I don't know, just for the fun. With that, you will join me as we begin our time this morning in prayer. Almighty God, you are here with us this day, and we thank you for it. Lord, we are in need of your touch today. Lord, it is the middle of summer. We are dealing with the heat and the humidity, but Lord, we also are dealing with a lot in our souls. And so, Lord, we are asking for you to come and move in our hearts, whether we are celebrating or grieving, whether we are learning generosity or figuring out how to make ends meet, Lord, whether we are reveling in healing or finding your peace and sickness, Lord, we ask that you will come and meet us today. Guide us and lead us in your ways. Transform us through our time here this morning that through worship and through word, through prayer and offering of ourselves and through uh, receiving Holy Communion today, Lord, we might not only meet with you, but be transformed by the meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. If you will stand and we will sing together.
Our scripture reading this morning begins in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read verse 1 and then we'll pick up with verse 13 later on this morning. Hear God's word. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. As we move into our time of prayer this morning, I ask that you will join me as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Father God, as we come into your presence this morning, we pray knowing that the first and last word is yours. Lord, we come to you with even the very words we pray. Lord, even the very model that your Son gave us, coming ahead of our own requests. Lord, your grace was there before we ever knew we needed it. And indeed, when we didn't know how to pray, you taught us, you showed us. And Lord, we thank you that your provision extends to even showing us how to call on you and that we can call on you. Lord, you'd be well within our in your rights to, to have just saved us and wiped your hands and walked away. But you wanted a relationship with us. It's why you saved us. And you turn your ears towards our pleading and you tell us to ask, to seek, and to knock. And that you are the good, good father who knows how to give good gifts to your children. And so, Lord, we come here this morning praising you for this relationship you have called us into. For this place where you have called us to walk with you. And where you walk beside us, where you have delivered us into freedom from slavery to sin and death and made us alive in you. By your blood, by water, and the Spirit. And so, God, we ask again that you will move in us this day, that you will transform us this day. Lord, that you would make us into a people who can be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. Lord God, come and move your hand. Come and work among us. Use us, Father God. There are so many who don't know this relationship yet, God, and it, it Lord, we, we love you so much, but you love us so much more. And Lord, we want other people to know your love that knows no bounds. And so, Lord, show us how to be your witnesses. And those who don't know you yet, draw them to you. And those who have wandered away, draw them back to you. And those who have been walking with you but have been led astray, draw them back to you. And where you see fit, use us in the drawing. Work not just through us here this morning, Father God, but through the believers in Christ around this community, Father God, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopal, non-denominational, whatever. Lord, those who call upon your name, we are the body of Christ together with them. And so work through all of us and all of our congregations and churches and assemblies that we might be your witnesses throughout this community. Work through the ministries that have gone out from this church. Uh, and, and our partnerships with others, Huey and Nana, uh, Lakeview Christian School and Youth for Christ as they prepare for the fall, uh, Potter's House and uh, Residing Hope Ministries, Lord Jesus, the circles and the minuses work through all of these, that to the ends of the earth, your name might get all the glory and praise. Father God, we lift up to you the needs of our family and our church and our extended family this morning. Lord, we do lift Davis up to you. Lord, we thank you that uh, it is only a fifth that she's dealing with. But Lord, we ask for wisdom for the doctors as they monitor her this week with these two back-to-back -back episodes. Father God, we ask that you would give them the eyes to see and the minds to interpret what they see and the hands to be your hands of healing to her beyond what medicine can do. 
Lord, I, I lift up to you our, our country and all those who are serving to keep it safe and free, Father God. And Lord, we ask for your protection for them. We ask for your hand as the uh, electoral process goes on throughout this year, Lord, that your will would be done. Lord, that you would guide us, that you would lead us, Lord. You have said that authority comes from you. And so, Lord, we ask that you will guide this process and that you will teach us to trust you through the process, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Lord, we lift up to you others from among our family who are struggling. We lift up to you Dean King, who, is, who has uh, undiagnosed problems they're trying to sort out, and we ask for your protection and healing for him, Father God. We lift up to you, uh, uh, Marilyn and Ed Cromer as they are having difficult times, and we ask for your hand to be upon them, that you will strengthen and care for them. Lord, we lift up to you, uh, uh, Father God, that has come up a few times lately, those who are in the foster care system, those who are being bounced around, Father God, these little ones who are in need of protection. Uh, Lord, we ask for your hand to move in their lives, that you would get them into safe and good homes, Father God. And, and particularly in the, the families that we're connected to here, Father God, we are praying for a resolution that is the best for these children, Father God. Lord, we ask you to move in all of these things according to your will and according to your great riches and glory, and we thank you that you hear our prayers this morning. God, remind us that we can always come to you any time of day or night, whether we are with others or seemingly alone, Lord, you are there with us. Lord, teach us to rely and depend upon you, especially as we enter into challenging days. Show us how to walk faithfully with you, whatever may come. Help us to see the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil for what they are, and to steer clear. Forgive us when we fall short, and show us how to offer your grace and forgiveness to others around us as well, as you have forgiven us. Lead us in your ways, guide us in your steps, that in everything your name might give all the glory, honor, and praise this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our shows will come forward at this time and receive our tithes and offerings.
Amen. You may be seated. Lord, we give you thanks for these gifts that you have given, for all the ways in which you have provided for us. And Lord, out of these many gifts you have given to us, so now we give back to you. Take these gifts and let them be more in your hands than they could ever be in ours. Use them to spread your word, your love, and your kingdom throughout Lake Placid and to the ends of the earth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> chapter 5, picking up in verse 13. I encourage you to follow along in your own Bibles. Uh, as always, uh, you are welcome to bring Bibles from home, whatever it is you normally study in during the week. If you study on a phone or a tablet, uh, those are also welcome. If it's the big computer on the desk in the corner, maybe not, but anything else is fair game. Uh, but I do want you to read these words for yourself, maybe come back to them during the week, hear what God is saying to you through his scriptures. Hear God's word this morning. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we open up your word this morning, we ask that you will speak to us. Lord, you know what our hearts need to hear. You know where we struggle and where we've overcome. You know where you have been working wonders in our lives, and you know the places we haven't opened up to you yet. And so, Holy Spirit, come and speak in the depths of our heart this day. Confirm your word in our lives. Tune our minds, our ears, and our hearts to know your voice and to tell it apart from all others. Speak to us, God, this day. Use whatever words I may offer, but you speak to us this morning that we may know and do your will and yours alone. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Pardon. Excuse me. This past week, we celebrated our nation's birth, our declaration of independence from Britain and tyranny, from taxation without representation, and from a host of other bondages that kept us from being truly free. We founded our country on principles of freedom for that very reason, because we had seen what happens when those freedoms aren't there. We founded it on freedom of speech, freedom of religious expression, freedom of the press, freedom of our rights as individuals to defend ourselves amongst a host of other freedoms. We believed it, we built, excuse me, we built it on the belief that all people are created equal by God. Took us a few extra years to work out the details of what it meant that all people are created equal, but we got there eventually. And that God has given us certain rights, inalienable rights, they were called, ones that since given by God cannot be taken away by men. That's what inalienable means. Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This was founded in the idea that we were created by God. And we believed that these truths were self-evident, that they were obvious to all. 
Any of those words sound familiar? You may have read the Declaration of Independence at least once in school. Those were the principles we as a nation were founded on. My question today is, as a nation, are we still there? At the foundation of it in our culture right now, the very idea that God exists is under attack. Now, mind you, and we may have some wavy definitions on what the Founding Fathers thought about God. We'll talk about that a little more. But central to our founding documents was the idea that not only did God exist, but he created us. And that in creating us, he gave us certain rights. And that he was, in fact, creator. Scripture agrees with this. Romans chapter 1, starting in 19, says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Paul tells us here that God's existence, if not necessarily all the particulars of his character, is evident just in creation alone. We call this natural revelation, that when you look at the natural world, it is clear that there is a creator, and we can discern a certain number of things about him. We can't necessarily make it all the way to Jesus dying on the cross from our sins just by looking at trees, but we can understand some things about a God who would put his son there in our place. Despite numerous advances in technology, the structure of the human eye not only lays beyond our capabilities to replicate, at least so far, although we're getting closer, but it's still a ways off yet. But furthermore, it shows itself to be a system that could not have just happened by chance. When we look at the precise positioning of our planet in orbit around the sun, a place that scientists call the Goldilocks sun, Goldilocks zone, because it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's... Yes. There we go. It's precise tilt and rotation. If we were a degree or more off in either way, from what I understand, life would not be able to be sustained. You might be able to chalk any individual thing up to coincidence, but all of them taken together. When you look at the complexity of nature, of its design, of the systems, of orbits, of the symmetry within flowers, of, uh, you know, the, the spiral that you can see in how things grow in nature, there are so many things that just shout out, somebody made this. And not a God of disorder, but a God of order. There are natural laws that are observable to the human eye. We can see that those laws are constant and set solid in motion. And it tells us about the character of God. That the myths of creation of uh, wildly self-involved gods doing things willy-nilly just doesn't fit the more we learn about how orderly this world is. It is clear that there is a creator. And yet we have seen more and more of this very idea under attack. The sciences wants tools to help us better study God's creation so that we could better learn his attributes. Theology, the study of God, was once considered the queen of the sciences. We can study the world because we believe God gave it order. There's no point in studying lightning if it only happens because Zeus woke up on the wrong side of the bed. But if we can observe particles gaining charge in clouds, 
then we know how to, if not fully predict, at least prepare for lightning so that we don't lose our Wi-Fi router every single week in the summer. And yet people try to say that science disproves God. Those people don't understand the nature of science. The very word science these days is wielded in an almost religious sense, a word invoked to lend credibility to whatever it is you are claiming to say about the world and to brand your opponents as ignorant and backwards. The idea that rights come from God then has also been, if not under attack, certainly in question. And whereas the world most of us grew up in was still largely Christian in influence, much of what we see today in this nation is what folks are calling a post-Christian culture. We have, as a society, followed up with the next couple of verses in Romans chapter 1. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. In other words, when we elevate the creation above the Creator and our own desires above the desires and commands of God, it all goes awry. I do want to point out, even the men who penned our founding documents held only a loose concept of God compared to what we have, particularly individuals like Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was a deist. He was uh, someone who was of the belief that God created the world, created the rights, and then backed off like a divine clockmaker, set his creation in motion, and then stopped messing with it. Which is why Jefferson didn't believe that God intervened in history at any given point and proceeded to cut all of the miraculous happenings out of his Bible, literally, with a pair of scissors. Because he couldn't believe in a God that actually broke his own laws from time to time, or at least warped them significantly. He couldn't handle a God who stopped the sun in the sky for an hour as Joshua was in battle, and he couldn't believe in a God that raised the dead. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't believe in a God that raises the dead, you're going to have some issues being a Christian. Let me ask this. Even he believed that we are given certain freedoms by God. But my question for you is, what does God want us to do with those freedoms? How does he want us to use them? I don't think I'm going to find a lot of argument for the fact that those freedoms are, at least at some level, under assault right now. Depending on how you're planning on voting in the fall, you may disagree on the nature of the assault. But I think one thing we can all agree on is that right now at this point in history, the question of what those freedoms are and how they're lived out is definitely in question. Do you think we can agree on that? Yeah? Okay. Any nays? No? All right, good. But how does God want us to use the freedom we have? Freedom is a concept as well that gets used at, similarly to science. It's, it's a punctuation at the end of a sentence. It's a club that we wield to say that there is no point in contesting me. I have freedom on my side. Hey, it's a free country, man. I can do what I want, right? We use it to defend everything from vile speech to public indecency. We curse out our leaders, or at least some guy named Brandon. Sorry, that might have been meddling a little. And then we say we're free to do it because free speech, right? It's a free country. But what does God ask of us? I'm not even worried about America as a whole at this point. 
because I'm not in front of Congress right now. I'm, I'm talking to the church. And I'm, I'm working off the broad assumption, and I think it's a fairly safe one, that those of us who are here this morning are believers in Christ. There's not a lot of great reasons to go to church if you're not at this point in our culture, okay? Unless somebody has brought you here because maybe you need to hear about this. But most folks don't just show up for no reason. So I'm talking brother to brother and sister here. We're soon to be brother and sister. What is God calling us to do with our freedom? Galatians gives us an interesting glimpse of this. First of all, as we read at the beginning of the chapter, Christ has set us free. Our freedom is rooted in something deeper than a national identity. Our freedom is rooted in what Jesus did on the cross for us. That if we put our faith in Christ Jesus, we are set free from bondage to sin and death. And it doesn't matter what country we live in, we have that freedom. And always will. While we have certain inalienable rights as God's creation, as the Founding Fathers believe, we have a deeper freedom in Christ. For while Romans 8 tells us that creation itself is longing also to be set free from bondage to sin, our passage here reminds us that as believers, we are set free from sin so as no longer to be enslaved to it. Paul is writing to a group of believers who have been told that they must fall under the Old Testament law and get circumcised, among other things, in order to be a follower of Christ. That if they really want to follow Jesus, they have to keep all of the purity laws, all of the temple laws. They can't wear uh, mixed cloth. They can't have bacon at the next church potluck. Uh, all, all the things. They have to follow all of those laws. And Paul says, no. We have been set free from the law. But that freedom comes with a warning. Don't use your freedom as a license for sin. Just Dave's opinion here, but I don't know that Paul would necessarily agree with someone who says, it's a free country, I can do what I want. Rather, he says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we should use our freedom as an opportunity to serve one another. Points us back to what Jesus called the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul here and Jesus in the Gospels both tell us that in following that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, and Jesus will add, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or rather, Paul leaves that out here. By doing these things, we fulfill the entire purpose of the law itself without being tied to having to follow every single commandment. Now, what the law teaches us still carries over. Paul says, do not use your freedom as a license to sin. It doesn't mean, hey, everything's fair game now. There were movements early on in Christianity and throughout the centuries that have taken that approach. They've said it doesn't matter what you do, you are forgiven, it's just your stupid flesh that's doing it, you're fine, just keep plowing through life. Now, Scripture tells us you are free, but do not get caught back into bondage to sin. Rather, use your freedom to love others. Jesus calls us beyond that when he says, not only love your neighbor as yourself, but greater love has no one than this, that they would lay down their life for another. So do we use our freedom for this? We are used to thinking about freedom as something that I have for me. Most of the things I see freedom talked about anyway come back to that. It's what I can do, what I can get away with, what I'm allowed to do, what can I say, own, drink, shoot, or do to my body. 
God meant our freedom as an opportunity, not a self-serving right. And I think that's one of the things we have lost. Maybe not as a church, but certainly as a nation. We have turned to ourselves. We have put the creation and even our own desires over the creator. And we are reaping the reward. If you keep reading the first chapter of Romans, you see what happens. God says, so, since they elevated creation over creator, God gives them over to their desires, their lusts, their idolatries, their pride. And I would argue that the kind of chaos we see in our world today is the result of that. Because we got our priorities backwards. God has given us freedom. And that freedom means we can serve others. We can love others. We can do good for others. We can lead others out of bondage to sin. There are countries right now in this world where you can't even tell somebody about Jesus without risking jail or execution. That's how this world is right now. We still have the freedom in this country to tell others about Christ. You may or may not be able to argue that that freedom is being infringed upon. I will leave that for smarter political minds than me. I listen to like 15 minutes of news a day, so, you know, maybe not my field. But we have the opportunity to tell people about Jesus. To bring them home to him. And I'm going to tell you, that's the greatest message we can give. There's a lot of other things we can get caught up in. And, and some of them are worth talking about. We get caught up in sexual ethics or uh, abortion rights or death penalty or so many other things and, and, and some of these are worth advocating for and I have friends and, and loved ones who run ministries that advocate for particular positions in these things but I'm going to tell you what if we don't tell people about Jesus it doesn't matter if you are the squeakiest clean person in the world You don't know Jesus, it's lost. And it is only in knowing Jesus that we have the freedom from sin to overcome the temptations for all the things that we would feel the need to outlaw anyway. Not that there shouldn't be laws, I've told you before. I'm a big fan of do not murder. I like staying alive. But if we spend our freedom just arguing for good causes. And we don't tell people about Jesus. They got no hope to change anyway. It's only by the work of the Holy Spirit that you and I get any of this right. You keep reading in Galatians, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle self-control. I get on this kick a lot. I apologize, but it's worth saying. Those are not the works of a determined flesh. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. They are produced by the Holy Spirit working in us who are believers in Christ Jesus. They're only possible because he's working on us. And where you see somebody out in the world doing good things, that's because at some level they've heard the Holy Spirit tugging on them and have at some level or another said yes. It may have been a self-serving yes. But any good we do, we are capable of doing because God is at work in us. We want to see this country turn around. We 
we want to dare I say make America great again yeah then America's got to be Christian again people got to know Jesus because it is Jesus who sets us free. Yes, we have some inalienable rights, but there is a greater freedom from sin, from bondage to death and slavery to our passions. There is a greater freedom that comes from the work of Christ in us. And it happened on a cross. Right before Jesus bought our freedom he gave his disciples a meal because one people like to eat but two he wanted to get our attention he took the defining moment of the Jewish people the Passover the thing that made them who they were, that set them free from bondage to Egypt, to tyranny and oppression, and said, I want you to understand a new covenant, a new agreement I'm going to make with you. You're not just going to be set free from a dominating national power. You're going to be set free from sin itself. And he told us, every time we eat and drink of this, to remember him, to proclaim his death until he comes again. Because we can get distracted by a lot of things, can't we? There's a lot of latest and loudest causes that it is easy to get caught up in. But the one that matters is that cross. And so when Jesus was getting ready to give his life for us, he, he took bread that was a part of the meal that they were sharing in. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, his friends, his followers. And he said, take and eat this. This is my body. Broken for you. Remember, this is for the cross. They don't know what this is yet. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, remember me. As the meal was over, he took the cup. There's four cups offered in the Passover meal. This one was the cup of redemption. And he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So whenever you drink of this, remember me. And so he commanded us to pass this down from generation to generation. And this table is open to everybody. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of any church in order to come and share in this meal with us. As long as you seek to follow Christ, repent and leave behind a life of sin and follow him as Lord and Savior, this table is open to you to receive his grace, his forgiveness again afresh and anew for yourself, to draw you back, to make a part of you at a physical, biological level, the grace of God moving in you. Almighty God, as we prepare to take this meal, we ask that you would pour out yourself on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Let them be for us the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, even as you make us in his body, redeemed by his blood, sent out to nourish a hungry and fallen world. Lord, by the work of your Holy Spirit, draw us together up in you. Make us one body in you, redeemed by your blood, set free by the cross. And Lord, let your love pour through us that all would know your forgiveness and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For those who are assisting with communion, come forward at this time. We will have you come up to the front in just a moment. You'll take a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and receive it for yourself. We also have the option of individually sealed 
uh, pieces of bread and cup, particularly if you have concerns about uh, immunity, colds, flus, that sort of thing, that is an acceptable option as well. We want to provide that to you. And if you are unable to make it to the front because of mobility issues, if you will lift your hand, somebody will come to you. Body of Christ broken for 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 you. Christ broken for you. Shit for you. Love Christ, shit for you. Love Christ, shit for you. 